Um, hi, everyone, again. It's such a wonderful pleasure and honor to launch into June edition Living Histories with Howard Stone's Living Histories talk. I am sure there's going to be a lot of exciting material, and I'm going to turn it over to Howard right away. Please take it away, Howard. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to uh, speak in this series. Uh, it's really um, interesting to think back about uh, one's trajectory in, in this uh, profession, in this life. So I'll start by just telling you a little about the family I uh, came from. My mother was born and raised in Augsburg, Germany, and uh, came as an uh, immigrant to New York City in July 1937. Uh, she was uh, in, a, in her teens then. Uh, my father uh, was born and raised in Munich, Germany, about 60 miles away. They didn't know each other. Uh, he was fortunate enough to leave uh, Germany with his uh, only brother and his parents. And uh, they raised a family in uh, upstate New York. And that's where uh, I was raised in the 1960s in Schenectady, New York. Um, in uh, just before high school, we moved to San Jose, California, which was a bit of a culture shock for someone from a small city in New York. And if you're interested, that's my, uh, those are my parents and my, uh, I have a twin brother, Peter on the left, uh, an older sister, Linda, and an older brother, David, and my mother's mother uh, is uh, to her left. And if you're not sure, that's me, by the way. Um, okay, uh, so there you go. All right, so I, I went to UC Davis uh, as an undergraduate. I had watched too much uh, television in high school, and so I was interested in history and law. I thought I was on a track to be a lawyer. Um, but in, uh, as a freshman in my first semester, I took chemistry like everyone else in the dorm who was a pre-medical student. And I had a class from uh, this man, Dino Tinti. Uh, he passed away. Uh, maybe a year or two ago. And he uh, effectively changed my trajectory. He, he showed me um, for really the first time in my life how exciting and interesting understanding science could be. And so uh, since I was uh, in my freshman year and I liked chemistry and my father was an engineer who uh, wanted his uh, children to be able to have a middle-class existence, uh, he encouraged me to do engineering. So I chose chemical engineering and UC Davis had a fabulous chemical engineering department, and two people who were quite influential intellectually uh, was, were Ruben Carbonell, who's now at NC State, and the late Stephen Whitaker. And it turns out I had a classmate uh, that year, a young man named Ali Nadim, who's now a professor in California, um, who really was one of the first people who ever showed me what intellectual beauty could be. Uh, if you've ever met Ali, you would understand that. And so I... Um, uh, continued on to Caltech. I was interested in quantitative things and fluid mechanics. I had Gary Leal as an advisor. And if you're interested, you know, now the kinds of things I do, um, here goes the story. I, I started learning about fluid mechanics. I learned about so-called low Reynolds number hydrodynamics. I found that very interesting and tried to develop intuition for it. And I've always liked going to seminars. So I went to lots of seminars. And it uh, turns out, you know, that was uh, good for me because I learned slowly. And if you're interested what my th thesis was, there's a, a slide from my thesis. It's going to be important in one second. I studied uh, drop how, how small droplets of liquid are deformed by flows that are stretching flows. And anyway, so, uh, you know, I then did a postdoc uh, in Cambridge, England, uh, in Department of Applied Math and Theoretical Physics. I had a postdoc advisor, John Hinch, who was very good friends with Gary Leal. And I learned a lot because in Cambridge, they had tea. They had it twice a day. And as an American, I sort of sat with a different group every day. And I, I saw questions. I saw answers. I saw puzzles. They had these white tables you could write on where you saw the answer. And then uh, and I sat with a different group nearly every day. And I got exposed to lots of other things in fluid mechanics that I never saw being trained in engineering. And so that was quite nice. And then, then a small miracle happened. I'm slightly out of... Uh, Sync. On the next slide, I'm going to tell you I became a professor. And when I became a professor uh, early in my career, uh, something crazy, something interesting happened, which is Kai Lee, who some of you might know in Chicago, uh, knew that I had worked on this drop deformation problem. And she told her postdoc advisor, Hardin McConnell, that his picture, which is in the lower right, looked like my picture. Uh, his picture had to do with lipid monolayers and how they phase separate and how they distort. 
Um, to a first approximation, of course, they have nothing in common. Um, uh, maybe the pictures look the same. And so I uh, tried unsuccessfully at first to work on a problem that I learned about through a letter. A letter, you know, you, 30 years ago, you got real letters from people, a letter from Hardin McConnell. And so that was my first real exposure probably to biophysics. Uh, so I ended up uh, getting a position at uh, Harvard. It was the only position I was offered when I interviewed for jobs. Um, and I was fortunate that I had amazingly supportive colleagues in mechanics and applied physics. And uh, I was there uh, 20 years, if you're interested. Uh, I, you should know I was very naive. If you think, uh, well, I can tell you about that offline. But again, I attended lots of seminars. And the wonderful thing was I got to go to seminars in mechanics and physics and material science and some biophysics. And uh, then sort of by accident, um, a number of things happened that remind me always of this quote from Pasteur. Uh, my French friends tell me it's better in French than in English, but it's chance favors the prepared mind. And uh, so early in my career at Harvard, I met Howard Berg. He encouraged me to come give a talk to his group about swimming microorganisms. Uh, my first paper in the subject was with R.V. Samuel, who was then an undergraduate who approached me with an interesting question they knew about. Uh, no one in Howard's group ever uh, remembered anything I gave a talk about. Uh, I know that because I showed a, uh, a film clip from G.I. Taylor's Low Reynolds Number Hydrodynamics movie, and that was the only thing they ever told me they remembered about the talk, uh, but go figure. Um, and I wasn't very creative at the time. I actually didn't really understand how to think about other research questions other than the ones I had seen. Um, but over a number of years, a number of people I met, I, I, I watched, I read their papers, I talked to them, and I've listed a few of them here, Armand Ashdari, Michael Brenner, Jan Zegers, Laurent Lima in Paris, David Kire and uh, George Whitesides at Harvard. And I think from them, I learned a bit more how to think creatively. And in, in fact, part of that was because uh, I like teaching and uh, I know several people in Living Histories have talked about teaching. I also found it a great way to learn and to think creatively because I like to think of new questions. It certainly helped my understanding. And so one piece of advice I have when you're thinking about creativity, find something you like teaching. And um, maybe that'll help give you a side of your life that will also help your creativity. But with me, what it uh, did is... Uh, I often found when I talked to my friends, whether it was Armand, actually it was first Armand, but then the others, um, I would give them feedback on something and they would often look at me and says, well, that's interesting what you said, but that wasn't even the question I was asking. And I started to realize there were other ways to ask questions in the field than just the way I had been trained in fluid mechanics or engineering. And so I found myself very attracted to uh, quantitative questions, uh, especially when they had uh, physical experiments associated with them. And so um, finally, uh, after moving to Princeton, you know, I've been able to continue my career. And I will say I've benefited from a remarkable group of people I've gotten to work with. So uh, I feel very fortunate that way. And I started to be most interested in working with people from other fields. And uh, in, in fact, I often found it most interesting to try to encourage people uh, to join me. And I will say that uh, two people have been with me a long time, um, that I've collaborated with a long time. Uh, Janine Newton's on the left, who first uh, worked with me when I was when uh, in, an, in an REU program, and uh, Manuk Abkarian on the right, who's visited me uh, continuously, and I visited him uh, over 20 years. And so they, they've actually, um, among many, but certainly are the two people I've probably interacted with continuously for the longest time. And they've been very important uh, to me also as I try and run my group and also think about how I can support the community, which is something I uh, often thought is very important. Uh, finally, a lesson I learned um, the hard way is I was often very afraid to tackle new questions. Um, and one day I remember talking to Dave Waits about this and he encouraged me to accept the idea that it's okay not to know but that we can figure things out. And I think that was really um, very helpful to me. And uh, uh, so I always remind myself of that, even if I have no idea what I'm doing. Um, finally, I, you know, I love collaborations. Uh, I think the one of the beauties of science and engineering is its international flavor and the fact that we can learn from people from other countries and other cultures. And I'll just close by saying, because I think I'm on time, I still enjoy teaching. Uh, I already said that I encourage you to do that 
I owe an enormous amount to my family who have been incredibly patient for me there on the right and our dog Eiffel is uh, there as well. And uh, finally, I'll just say, if I had any advice, I'm not sure I have any great advice, but um, find a set of topics you enjoy and use it to form your own lens to look at the world. In my case, that world, I think about a science and engineering, you might call it something else, but uh, use it to form your own lens and you'll have a wonderful, wonderful time. And so that's my uh, short life history. Uh, thank you so much, Howard. On behalf of the audience, I'm clapping. Audience, please feel free to send me your questions via chat. We'll ask a selection. Uh, to warm things up, I'm going to start with a question of my own, which is, um, Howard, um, believe it or not, in all of the living histories to date, no speaker has ever mentioned that they loved going to seminars, which you did. Um, so would you please tell us a little bit about exactly what aspect of it was particularly great for you and how things have evolved in Zoom era? Um, well, I, I've, I sort of, I've always liked learning and I think I've benefited over the years a lot from osmosis. You know, I will admit that I normally bring something to write and read because when I get lost, I want something to do. Uh, I found for myself that I pay most attention, one, when I'm not tired, uh, but two, when I sit near the front, uh, and so I played games that way. Um, I feel like, you know, I remember once telling my advisor after a seminar that I completely did not understand. I just said, I walked out, I was uh, uh, frustrated and I said, I will never, ever understand this. Uh, eventually by osmosis, I sort of understood it and that helped. And a great thing I learned at Harvard, uh, I, th I think this is probably true. I used to go to the applied physics seminars, or maybe they call them something else. Uh, Bert Halpern, David Nelson, David Vanderbilt, Daniel Fisher. And they asked lots of questions. And often it was a race if they would figure things out before the speaker got to the end. But I, I think sometimes they were asking questions to help the audience. And so sometimes I think that's not a bad thing for a professor to do. If the speaker's going a little too fast, you help everyone by asking a simple question. Often you're just helping yourself, of course. But I really think it's valuable. You know, you, we spend all this time in seminars, learn something from it. You know, even if it's just a little like, what's the question they're asking? And so um, anyway, so for me, I think it's been very helpful. And I have lots of little stories I can remember from interesting things people said when asked questions or in the middle of talks. So anyways. Uh, thank you. Um... We have time for one more question. So I'm going to ask you about something that did not come up in your talk, uh -oh. which, okay. <laughs> which is uh, perhaps a complementary side of your life or your, um, or, or your interests that does not touch upon physics or biophysics. Huh. Um, so every, <laughs> every Christmas for the last 20 years, I've given, um, uh, I've organized, but it's with a set of people. I give a public lecture on science and on science and engineering for children and families. It was inspired by um, the Christmas lectures that Michael Faraday did. Uh, I first did it, I think in uh, 2003, when I read a book by um, C.V. Boyce called On the Surface of Things. Uh, and in reading the book, he had done, he just gave his notes from a Christmas lecture. And I told someone at Harvard that, look, if we want to do outreach, he just, he, he, all we have to do is copy him. Uh, and so that was the first time I did it. It was, uh, I, I asked Dudley Hirschbach to come because he had written about Ben Franklin. I had a, I got a Ben Franklin impersonator to come. Uh, there were only 50 people in the audience, but now every year there are normally a few hundred. Uh, and with Janine, who I introduced and, Catherine Holler at Harvard and Dan Steinberg at Princeton and uh, Daniel Rosenberg at Harvard. We've done it uh, for the last 20 years and uh, it's fun. And we do it four times, usually over two, one or two weekends. And I learn, I learn a ton. And often I don't, I only know a little bit more than the audience, but I'm the one speaking. So I have a head start. And um, we do demonstrations and the kids get free t-shirts and they're color coded to the seminar or the lecture and, 
Uh, anyways, so we do that. It's 50 minutes long. Last December, we did it on climate science. We wow. have a new topic every year. Yeah. Wow. How wonderful. And sometime I'm going to get tired and stop. But uh... it's, it sounds like a riot. How wonderful. Thank you so much once mm -hmm. again on behalf of the audience. And in the interest of time, I'm closing the recording.